Thank you to everyone for joining the webinar uh, today, which is brought to you, of course, again, by the RTO ERO Foundation. My name is Mike Prentice. I'm the executive director for the foundation. The mission of the RTO ERO Foundation is to invest in programs, research, and training to support active, healthy aging for all Canadians. Our activities aim to improve seniors' health care, end social isolation, and combat ageism. Uh, I should, maybe before I continue, make sure everyone can hear me. Just pop something into the chat if you can hear my voice okay and the sound is good and all that. Excellent. Sounds good. That's all I need to hear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so before we get started, um, Deanna, if you can uh, uh, pop up our land acknowledgement, we'll do our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. So we are uh, very excited uh, today to have as our presenter, Laura Tamblin Watts from CanAge. You're seeing her, uh, her image up there on your screen. I'll properly introduce her uh, in a moment after a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, so as usual, it's the same format every time we do these. It's an hour, we have an hour together today. Laura will walk us through a, a, a presentation. And after that, we'll be available to answer uh, some questions from the audience, which we know we'll have, uh, we always have lots of questions. Um, as always, we ask that you type your questions into the Q&A. There's the Q&A and there's a chat and you can engage with us and with Laura either way. Uh, it's best to put sort of your formal questions that you want Laura to be able to see and answer in the Q&A. But if there's anything else or any notes or any thoughts uh, throughout the presentation or after, uh, you can also feel free to pop some notes in the chat there. And if there's anything in there that Laura sees and would like to uh, address, uh, she will do so. We'll get to as many of the questions, of course, as we can in our one hour together. Today's webinar is maybe, maybe has my favorite title so far, Social Inclusion, A Practical Guide to Future Proof Your Relationships. I love this title. So addressing social isolation and loneliness has been a, a focus uh, you know, for the RTO ERO Foundation since 2018. Uh, of course, in the wake of the global pandemic, a light has really been shone on how critical this, this situation has been and continues to be for far too many older adults in Canada. So this webinar is exciting, is really about understanding the issue, but more importantly, what we can do to start fixing it. And so let me introduce our presenter and uh, then I'll turn it over to her and Laura, uh, please feel free to correct me on any of uh, any of these points if I get any of it wrong. Laura Tamblin Watts, who you're now seeing on screen there, is CEO of CanAge, Canada's national seniors uh, advocacy organization and a global expert on aging. I will say, if I may, uh, that CanAge is a fantastic organization doing some really, really incredible work. Um, I will let Laura, if she'd like, provide a bit more background on CanAge, but we're very honored to have her with us today. Uh, and to continue building a relationship between CanAge and RTO ERO, as well as us at the foundation. So Laura previously served as Chief Public Policy Officer at the Canadian Association of Retired Persons and as the National Director for the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. She is Assistant Professor in the Factor Inwintash Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto where she specializes in research on law and aging. So Laura is, I mean, there's more, I'm sort of cherry picking bits of her, uh, of her CV, but Laura is an absolute expert in the field of aging and seniors health and wellness. And so we're just truly grateful to have her with us for an hour for today's webinar. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. And I will turn uh, the presentation over to you. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here, but we have all just received news that our queen has died. And I just want us to take a moment of silence and recognize the passage of uh, a woman who has led generations. And thank you for the work that you have done on behalf of all of us today. And I'll just ask for a small moment of silence and recognition. Oh, it's going to be a big day, isn't it? Well, when we're thinking about shifting generations, as we've seen the Queen's, if we've seen the Queen expand her life and move, we can be inspired, I think, a bit by her life in many ways as well. And one of them is how active and engaged she was 
through her entire life well into her 90s. And maybe we'll take again some of that inspiration and talk about how we can learn from that and other examples, whether you're a, a monarchist or not a monarchist. She's certainly a person who has led by example in how to live a rich, active, and engaged life. I am going to be very active in the chat. You see that I am right now. And I'm going to ask that you be again, as active as you like in the chat. If you put things in, I will respond to them very quickly. And you can put more formal questions in the Q&A as well. I'm a big believer in lots of engagement. So let's use this time together to be as active and engaged as possible, even at this very sad time. I'm going to share a presentation and I hope that the first part will make you laugh a little bit because the first thing I want to do is share my lesson plan. I am also a teacher. So <laughs> this is my mother who is 86 this year and has been a lifelong teacher as well. And the first thing she ever taught me was have a lesson plan and stick to it. Let people know what you're going to talk about and let them know how to participate. So before I do anything else, I'm going to acknowledge my wonderful mother, Tanya McKay, and her importance of a good lesson plan. I'm going to skip through the intro very quickly. And um, I am going to spend our most of our time talking about a little bit of the what, so what, now what. And I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully engage that very actively. Right now, I see we have a question of how many people in this webinar. We're about 450 so far, and more are still coming in. So I'm very happy that we have such a great engagement. And I hope this is going to be one of many opportunities that we have to spend time together. We're a huge fan of our work together. So we're going to talk about future proofing. I am going to apologize if I made any errors in French. I actually did it myself bilingually. And my uh, my high school French teacher was probably going to point out somewhere, because I know you're watching, I'm sure, Ms. Pampana, that I am I'm sure got a participle wrong or missed an accent. So if any French errors, they're mine and not the organization's. So my name is Laura Tamblin Watts, and I am the CEO of CanAge, which is Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. We are a national pan-Canadian not-for-profit. We are nonpartisan. That's very important to us. I won't say we're not political because we are political in the sense that we work for the rights and well-being of all Canadians, but we work with all political parties and we're extremely collaborative by nature. We are the largest seniors organization in the country, and I'll never sell anything we're not here it's free to join and we exist only for the advancements of the rights and well-being of all Canadians as we age we have a motto and our motto is if we're doing it alone we don't do it so what you will see is just this is a very small group of many many organizations that we work in partnership and of course, our first one, one we want to acknowledge is our wonderful partnership that we have with the RTO, ERO, and how very pleased we are to both acknowledge and support such a fantastic organization. I come from a family of teachers, and I married into a family of teachers, and my daughter is going to become a teacher. So when I say this is the family business, I really mean it. My dad's a lawyer, but my mom is a teacher, and a lot of what I just do is teach law. And so... I want to give a special heartfelt thank you to all of you for all of the amazing work that you've done. Many of you have reached out extra during the time of COVID-19, and I want to acknowledge that fantastic support. And for those of you teachers who may be working right now, um, you, I know that September is such a busy time. Yes, happily ever older. I am in that book. Not only am I in the book, even a pizza party that I hosted was in that book. And I met uh, all the time with Moira Walsh and, uh, and I heartily recommend it as well. Just in my very fast overview, we created a policy book because we don't want to be coming from issue to issue. We want to make sure that we talk about what a roadmap is not just for ourselves as individuals, but for our country and our communities as well. And I invite you to have a look at our website. And if you uh, don't want to do it that way, I can probably get a, a stamp out somewhere and mail it to you as well. And 
you'll see that under these six compass points, we actually have 135 specific recommendations. We're about to refresh that. And we got 141 individual policy wins across the country within two years. So certainly we're not all the way there yet, but we are trying to work together across communities, across organizations to really address individual issues. And one of the big issues, of course, that we've been talking a lot about, and perhaps never before so much as in COVID-19, uh, is social exclusion. And let me just give you a little bit of the some of the issues that we've put. These are big topic area issues, and underneath it are different, very specific recommendations. But you'll see that loneliness and social exclusion is really the, the beginning of that. And let, let me give you a little bit of a sense just off the top. In 2018, August 2nd, 2018, if you want to go look it up, you will see it was recorded by our Statistics Canada that 20%, so, you know, one in five, 20% of seniors in Canada do not have a single individual person to reach out to in the time of even an emergency. And this is, as we've seen under the StatsCan 2021 report, we know that rural communities are super aging communities. And it doesn't take much to be rural. You know, just outside one of our big centers will do it for you. So this is an issue. And I know that you know you can't open up a news source without hearing that we're going to be one in four people over the age of 65 by, you know, 20. 30, and we actually thought originally we had until 2041, but we're moving forward. This is not a terrible thing, but it is the reality. And it's important that we think about social inclusion, what it means and what it doesn't mean. And really also trying to make sure that we're thinking about it with real evidence, because we don't want to be just using kind of pandering ideas to this. We want to make sure that what we know is backed by evidence and then try to figure out not just as a community, but I'm hoping that we create a little bit of a roadmap uh, to talk about what you can do. And I'll, I'll be a little bit um, provocative in that as well. So the what, right? Ageism and social exclusion. We are all trained to identify things like this. We are trained to see that kid that's excluded from the group or eating lunch alone, or maybe a kid that's excluded because of some type of visible or non-visible difference, a person with special needs, a person who may have linguistic challenges. We can see it now increasingly, of course, electronically and in person. This is a lot when we think about social inclusion and social exclusion, particularly as teachers, this is quite a bit what we are able to see quite quickly. We often are also pretty available in our thinking to see images like these and see social exclusion as well. We have the person who is lonely, obviously staring out the window. We have the eyes a bit worried or somebody actively going through. Could be loneliness. It could be grief. We don't know. And then there is the all too familiar picture of the older person in a long term care home, often needing a mobility assistance, who's sitting alone. Now, let me tell you a terrible thing. During the time of COVID-19, one of the things that we were hearing about, of course, is how important it was to connect particularly with people who were in group and congregate care homes. And again, we're coast to coast to coast, so they're called different things in different places. But, you know, in BC, and I saw we've got some Vancouver folks here that would be called residential care. In Ontario, we call it long-term care. You might call it seniors' lodges in Alberta. It's that 24-7 nursing. And yes, we have, of course, had families who were absolutely devastated. And we knew that the social exclusion led to not just physical um, pangs of loneliness, it led to actual, in some cases, the lack of ability to eat. It stopped people from being able to toilet. 
it actually has a fundamental physical aspect that is measurable and social inclusion and social exclusion are not necessarily loneliness. You can be socially excluded without being lonely, but they are often tied together. But the reality of the circumstances in many cases, we have people like the picture up in the top right quadrant who doesn't have any family to visit or don't have any friends. Right now, generations live farther than they've ever far lived before. The average distance, if you live across provinces of people kind of in, in the Gen X and boomer generation from the later boomers and, and greatest generation, it's about 2,200 kilometers. And if you live in province, it's more like 400 kilometers. As we've seen with some legislation, if people are being moved around, it, it, particularly if it's the peer, if it's your spouse or somebody the same age as you, even moving a short distance can be a challenge and a barrier. But again, a lot of the reality is people weren't getting visited before anyway. And I just want to refresh that 2018, 20% of seniors don't have anyone to reach out to in the case of an emergency. What we're not as good at is recognizing things like social inclusion, future proofing, as I'm calling it, loneliness in people like this. If you look down on the bottom right, that's a busy intergenerational party. It looks like it's a great event. That older person is socially included, we think, right? They're sitting there, they're... But if you look at the face, does he have dementia? Does he have hearing loss? One in three people over 80 have significant hearing impairment, one in four of the age of 65. And I'm 51 and I have hearing impairment. You can be socially excluded. And I'd love to hear in the comments if anyone's ever had this experience by going to a really loud restaurant. How loud is the music in restaurants these days? You can't even have a conversation. Even if that person did have no, pretty good hearing. It's just so loud that you can't. So sometimes there's situational exclusions. And as we're thinking about how to future proof your places, one of the things you can start doing is making lists of places that aren't too loud to have a conversation or to go to. So again, a hidden piece. The picture of the woman on the phone with the tulips. Is she a person who's talking to a scam artist who's calling her because she's gotten hooked and because she's lonely? And the only person that calls is somebody who's looking for money. Is the person who is pruning his flowers able to get back up again? <laughs> Was he a person that is suffering arthritis? Is he a person that now can't drive anymore because his eyesight is devolving with macular degeneration? Is that woman with the glasses got glaucoma? Do we know how that may have affected her ability to connect, to read, which may have been a passion area for her? Does she have access to other types of adaptive devices like the audiobooks or other ways of finding her way around? Has her glaucoma caused her to fall and try to make sure that she is now feeling safe enough so she doesn't really go outside anymore. Just because she's smiling doesn't mean she's necessarily socially excluded. I would love you to share, if you feel comfortable, some experiences that you have had or other people that you know that may have hidden types of social exclusion. Again, things like dementia, arthritis, can't get up the stairs anymore. I've got a wonky knee and I look at my stairs and think, uh, up is not so bad, but down is really bad. Or, you know, I, I'm not sure if, you know, my, uh, my parents in five years will be able to drive and they live in a place where driving is very important. Will they be still able to visit friends? One of the other ways that people can be socially excluded is if other people move away into, say, assisted living or supportive housing. You may be staying in your own home, but your friend group may be dissipating. And that can be hard. Losing a driver's license, Ellen, thank you for sharing. That's a really important thing that people can really be affected. I want to recognize that uh, Lorna was talking about exclusion and family events. But again, you get down, make sure you got a plan on how to get back up again. 
Make sure that you've got hand grips everywhere and rails, making sure that we have social inclusion, doing some pre-thinking about what it is that causes exclusion and try to actually take some steps around it. So again, a lot of hidden pieces in there. So why does it matter? Just to give you a little sense, ageism is rampant. This is a brand new study that's come out. A third of Canadians say they've treated someone differently because of their age. And in the differently, let me be clear, and I've got the citations for you because I know someone's going to want the citations. They mean more negatively. 63% of people over 66 say they've been actively discriminated against. They've been treated unfairly or differently. And I'm surprised it's as low as that. 71% that say that Canadian society values young generations older than the older ones. And I'm betting the other difference of that number are older people who are still hoping that tonight. Continence and incontinence are huge aspects of social inclusion, Mary Lynn. Thank you for drawing our attention to that. And that is one of the areas that people often can't go out or they feel like they can't is because it can be such a challenge. It's interesting because 50% of the Canadians say that ageism is the most tolerated form of social exclusion, and it's actually an underestimation, and I'll talk about a global study in a minute. That's an underestimation. And 89% of the Canadians here indicated that they felt that aging was a negative effect. A lot of people avoid places where they can't be active because of sensory deficits. A lot of people are challenged because our society doesn't think about the most basic things we need in our life. Again, sensory, body, and so forth. So many of these things we could change. So it's really up to us not only just to advocate as we do together as organizations, but to help you, again, think about what some of these things are and try to figure out how to either avoid them. Here are some of the ways that older Canadians have expressed that they have had discrimination affect them. And again, I really think that this is a stark underestimation. The assuming of memory loss or the infantilization, again, I know for a fact is a massive underestimation. The infantilization of older people is absolutely rampant. Let me tell you a story. My grandmother, Ida, she was in another world would have been like a CFO. But, you know, she taught at a normal school. This is back in the day. She was uh, born in the 1800s. And my grandma, Ida, never drove. And she never drove because at that time, ladies didn't drive. Her husband drove, my grandpa. But she was sharp as a wit when it came to finance. And even though she was actually a teetotaler, she had no problem investing in things like Molson and so on. It would go down to the financial institution, which is a large financial institution whose, you know, initials you would see on any high street. And she banked there and invested there for years and years and years. So when she was a little bit older and she didn't have the ability to get new ways around. She couldn't walk anymore to the financial institution. She didn't bike. I would drive her. And the minute that I went into that financial institution, and then she was very well known there. She would go kind of every Thursday. She knew everybody's birthdays. She went to, you know, weddings and funerals and would check in on people. The minute, the minute the investment advisor saw me, who do you think he talked to? Was it his client of like 30 years? No, they turned to me. And I was in my 20s. And I can tell you for a fact, I had no 
idea at that point about anything to do with finances. And woe be the investment advisor that turned to Grandma Ida and said, just a second, and then turned to me and said, what does your grandma want to do today? <laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't think I should answer that question because it won't be polite and it may involve taking your head off again. For Melanie, again, it was 20% of people, stats can report August 2nd, 20, uh, 2018. 20% of people don't have a single person to reach out to in the state of an emergency. I really want to emphasize the great point that Margaret brings is that this is also an intersectional issue from our LGBTQ plus communities to our ethno-culturally diverse communities to people with gender and sexual diversity and all other forms of diversity and certainly indigenous diversity. We know that discrimination is intersectional. So if you're older and you're more likely to be discriminated against. And when you look at these, these numbers, I want you to think about, these are just the people who've recognized it on the basis of age and actually haven't recognized it on other forms of discrimination as well. I think we've all seen the Lisa Laflamme scandal as well. And I can tell you that CanAge leaned in immediately we see the hair go gray at a woman of 58. And that's when we're talking about things like ageism and sexism. And it's really critically important that we acknowledge both of those things together. And it doesn't help that we are constantly getting these messages. So I teach at the University of Toronto and I start my class, which is a master's of social work and gerontology class. So let's be clear. These are people who have chosen to go into the field of gerontology. They want to do this. And I asked them to take out sticky notes. You know, you do, right? I said, give them a bunch of sticky notes. And I say, you have 60 seconds. And I want you to write as many words on a sticky note as you can when I say the following three words old, frail, or dementia. And you would think frail and dementia would get the worst answers, right? I mean, just kind of think, you know, that's, those are words that have a lot of negative. Old does. Old gets a couple of grandparents and a few wises and so on. But the overwhelming sense of narratives around aging are so toxic that when we're coming to think about future proofing and social isolation and loneliness and inclusion, we are fighting to have age recognized. Let's have a little look. And this is an American study and there's been Canadian studies as well, but I liked this infographic. And what we are seeing, and this has been particularly true over the time of COVID-19, when we're seeing terms like boomer remover for COVID-19, or has anyone else heard things like, ah, it's just affecting seniors, you know, we can't not go shopping at the mall just to keep, you know, old people, they're just going to be in their homes anyway. So we need to get on with our life and go to the bar. Well, that's what I did for the last two years is fight against narratives like that and be thinking about what it means to be included, when it means to be excluded. So we do know that there are older numbers here. So this one says one in four seniors 85 felt lonely at least some of the time in the US. We have a Canadian study, and again, I can provide some additional citations that says it's actually worse than that in Canada, but it is at least one in four. It seems to be getting worse than that. We've got some new studies on loneliness. And loneliness, again, does not necessarily equate with social exclusion. Social exclusion means other things are happening to you. Loneliness is a feeling that you have, but they obviously tie together. And so as we battle against social exclusion, as we fight to bring in to things like diversity, equity, inclusion, age into that narrative, and to share with people that it wasn't just being young that was supposed to be in there, it's also being across our whole life course. We also need to think about ourselves and what we're going to do and how to recognize some of those risk factors to it. 
So how bad is it to be lonely or socially excluded? Well, I talked a little bit about how it can affect your body. So really interesting studies have been done. There was one that was uh, done in Canada during time of COVID-19. We've had other ones done prior to COVID-19 and what we see is consistent. When people are socially excluded and or people are lonely, their mental health suffers. In fact, the, the rate of depression goes up, we believe, between 40 and 50%. So that is a massive statistical change. We know that it is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So you wanna know where the Surgeon General's warning or our Health Canada warnings should be? There should be warnings on loneliness. And how seriously are we taking it as a society? Well, let me tell you, the US, has been taking this quite seriously, but I really like the UK's version better. The UK has appointed a minister for loneliness in the cabinet. And the loneliest cohorts in our country, and this has been pretty consistent in other Commonwealth countries, keeping with the, the, the theme. I don't have some studies from, from some of the Asian countries. Um, is people between 15 and 23 and people over 75. And that's why one of the things we're going to talk about is intergenerationalism. So your teaching skills, your connections, you as older people, and I say older as very much a, you know, a broad spectrum of what we consider, you know, you're not in high school anymore, you're not in elementary school anymore. You know, you have an ability as teachers, as supporters to help younger people. Those first slides we saw of those younger folks, well, they need you more than ever because social isolation, not just during the time of COVID-19, but especially in social media worlds is skyrocketing among youth, but it is also skyrocketing amongst people 75 or older. So here's a few things that we can think about. Seniors who suffer from loneliness have a 64% higher rate of dementia. That's actually how I got my dad to get hearing aids, finally. I gave him the studies from the Lancet Journal that said that about 40 to 43% increased risk factor for you know significant hearing loss without being assisted uh, it was for the tie to dementia as well i would mentioned earlier that there was about a 50 percent factor that canadians saw in that study around discrimination and negative ideas about older people well the global report on ageism by the World Health Organization has recently come out and it found that ageism is in fact the single most prevalent form of discrimination in the world. And I have to tell you, it's not like we don't have lots to choose from in terms of things that we discriminate people about. And that active isolation in Canada is, you know, about 17%. So if we're thinking about, is this a life or death situation? Yes. It's interesting because it, we have here that 46% of women 75 and older live alone. It doesn't mean necessarily they're lonely. It doesn't necessarily mean they're socially isolated, but you'll see that there are key points where people start having smaller social groups where you have to, at a certain point, think, how am I going to be more proactive about this? And I want to flag men's loneliness and I know that you're going to have a session coming up next month and men's sheds is one of the things that we're, I'm not going to steal the thunder there, but men's loneliness is gone from, well, of course, you know, his wife died and then they die a year or two later, kind of as a sort of uh, parole that we talk about to actual studies on men's suicide. And really it does tend to be about things like social exclusion. So intro, what, so what, and now I'm going to talk about the now what. So if you're going to pick up your pens or if you're going to start uh, putting some things in here as well, here's a bit of what you can do to help. So there's some good risk factors that you can do a bit of a checklist for. If you can't leave your home or you're in, in a difficult situation leaving your home, put that down. If you live alone, Put that down as well. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be lonely. Lots of people like to live alone. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that, but you're more likely to be lonely or socially excluded if you live at home. Doesn't mean you are. It just means that you need to think about it a bit more.
However, if you're feeling alone and disconnected, that's a giant red flag. Think about major losses and changes or what I call the Hallmark test, the Hallmark greeting card test. If someone in your life or you have had a reason to send a card, I'd say check your will, check your powers of attorney. Happy to come back on and talk about that as well. It's one of my favorite things to talk about across this country. But the second thing is assess does that mean that that person is going to be more lonely or, or feel more socially excluded or isolated? Is that going to affect you? Did they lose a spouse? Did they lose a friend? Are they moving? Are they moving to what they think is going to be their fantastic? They love their cottage and they're going to now move to this rural community. That's great, but they may feel disconnected. They may feel isolated. If you're a caregiver, and let's be clear, most of us are. Even if you don't self-identify as a caregiver, most of us are caregivers, and most of us will be caregivers. If you're in the process of actively providing care to somebody, your chances of social isolation are increased. And boy, I mean, I had three kids in almost as many years, and I was constantly around people, but I remember feeling so isolated as I had like a one, two, and three-year-old and thinking, you know, I'm constantly out in the world trying to do this or trying to get something that, and I was, but I felt very, very alone. If you wake up or somebody else you twig to, if you feel like you don't have a, a purpose in your life, that's important. I'm not telling you to get a hobby. I'm telling you to think about what your purpose is and not to assume that your idea of a purpose is the same as somebody else's. This is the stuff that we get or what I call the eat right and exercise model. Yeah, OK, I know I should eat right and exercise. I had Dairy Queen yesterday. You know, sue me. Right? Like, if everyone ate right and exercised, we'd all be awesome. It's great, but like we don't do that. I mean, yes. So these are all important things. I am not telling you that they're not important. They are. Stay connected, find an activity, get moving, exercise, volunteer, or, you know, have another job, stay in touch. All of these things are good. But if you think about something like depression, these are all things that, you know, I if I wasn't depressed, I could probably do. But when you are depressed, it's hard to get moving. It's hard to volunteer. It's hard to find a, the desire to do things. Now, I'm not saying that those things are the same, depression and loneliness or social exclusion. They're not, but they certainly then over. So again, I, yes, eat right and exercise and do all these things, but what can we do a bit more proactively? Well, this one is actually from the National Institute on Aging, the American the National Institute on Aging, not the Canadian one, although we're great friends and colleagues as well. Actually, adopting a pet is one of the best things you can do, particularly if it's a dog. It gets you moving because your pet needs to go outside. It gets you talking to people. There have been studies that if you're walking a pet, and I'm you know, I guess you could walk your rabbit or your cat, I, not so much of the common, but if you're doing that, people come and talk to you and you talk to those people and you could come to uh, parks and so on. So those small social connections actually really increase, not only just may you feel connected to a pet, but those small interactions. And actually for people with dementia who can't necessarily have their own pet, some of those really good robot pets actually uh, work quite well. And there's more around that. But we know that loneliness and socialization can happen in lots of different ways as well. And here's a few of them. We talked about aging it already. Just moving. I moved a number of different places in my life. I moved to Toronto from Vancouver. And that, that's a hard move to take sometimes for people. Divorce. Absolutely. Feeling like you're losing your friend groups for one reason or the next. Kids out of the house or, or grandkids out of the house. Any sense of loss or, or mental health, being just being alone, aging alone, even if you are very well connected with your family or friends, so you may be with lots of younger people, but remember that older person that was sitting at that table. If you're the only person of your age group, you may feel like nobody shares your stories. I want to tell you of a, a, a wonderful man I was just speaking with the other day. In Nova Scotia and he's well into his 90s and he's got great stories and he's a he used to be a famous hockey player he's 93 years old and one of the things I was talking to with his family members is how hard it is for him because nobody remembers who he used to be that he was a giant hockey star and we connected him together with another 
friend of ours whose father was in his 90s who was also a huge hockey fan and they knew who they were and even though this first gentleman was always with family and friends and socially connected he was lonely and felt isolated because nobody shared his memory so we need to think about that as well falling off the tech train and this is my french uh my french excuse i have no idea what falling off the truck train is in french so you saw my apologies to all the french teachers there if you have an opinion about what i should have said please uh, please share that with me but it's really hard i mean if everyone's snapchatting you or you know instagramming you they're like well if you were just on fill in the blank TikTok, whatever then you would know it's hard like People still are looking at real maps. Oh, well, I just pull in the GPS. So we get so um, comfortable and rolling along with it. But I think, you know, well, my mom, you know, she was born in 1937. You know, we had shared phone lines for years at our cottage, right? And now, is that what it is? Well, thank you very much. I wasn't even sure if that was really an actual expression or not in French. He says, tombe du train technologique. We know that it's really hard to keep up. I'm 51 and I have a hard time keeping up. So it's this falling off the tech train when you think just it's too much. Okay, that's fine. You can do that. I'm just saying. But we need to be more aware of who's where in their technological. 86% of seniors in Canada are are online. 86%. It is a false that they're not. They are. And the majority have more than five connected devices. So it's not like people aren't online, they are, but they may not be on the same sites as you or the same online as you. And we need to understand that and meet people where they're at. So I'm gonna land this plane. Here's my future proofing formula. Math wasn't my best, so I know it's not quite the right you know, algorithm here. It's my three plus five plus 15 and do it twice. And yes, the slides will be available for you. Here's your magic. Three close relationships, three people that you know that you can talk to, not just in the case of an emergency, but three people that you could share your feelings with. Five people to chat to, even if it's somebody that you see regularly, like the post office person that you see on a regular basis, if they still give you mail. <laughs> three people to chat with. Could be the coffee shop person that you chat with, but that's someone you would chat. The more you might chat with them or the better you feel about that, the better. 15 people in a social group that you know. Count them. Do you know 15 people? And do you know where they are? Could you reach out to 15 people? Now, I'm not saying they might, you know, lend you money or give you a ride across town. But 3, 5, and 15. That's your relationships. But we have a second version of that as well. People generate out right? We need people across generations. So that wonderful man that I was talking about, who doesn't have a lot of other people in his life who are 93, has other generations to support him. It was lovely, though, when we got his generation connected. And that really, as I said, lightened him up. But we can grow old and our friends can die. Three things to do weekly. Even if it's grocery shopping, walking the dog, reading a book, three things to do weekly. I'm sorry, five things to do weekly. My apologies. They sanction as FFX men. Five things to do weekly. Make sure that if you have your calendar, it's just nothing, you know, nothing in it. Make sure that you're doing, are you going to a movie? Even if you're kind of watching a TV show and also a friend is watching a TV show and you're going to talk about it, that counts. But have five things to do weekly. You might be going to a faith group, whatever. And then this one's actually harder. 15 outings a year. So that is once a month, plus an extra couple of holidays. Schedule it. 15 outings a year. Is it to the theater? Is it to visit a friend? Are you going to the park and having a picnic? And be proactive. This is your lesson plan. Oh, yeah. And you should also be right in exercise too. That's important as well. I suggest a bit of a dashboard. I've taken this from my friend's book called Options Open Guide by Sue Lance, and I have that site for you as well. And to go through these different kinds of things, so health is one, housing is one, and so on, and map out where some of these issues. 
Outings are an issue with an ongoing pandemic, absolutely. And so if you feel like you can't do that, it could be an outing with an outdoor walk. It could be sitting in your backyard, as I did with many people across the yard, kind of yelling at each other a little bit. Again, e write in exercise is really important. Staying connected, staying in touch, volunteering. But try to do it again in different aspects of your life. And don't forget your three plus five plus 15 times two. Here's just a quick slide that the ARP put together to help you think about the what we call domains of livability. And we started off talking about respect and ageism and social inclusion and what that meant. But we know that these issues are in other forms of domains as well. And we know how important our organizations are working together to make sure that social inclusion is in each of these areas. They have to all be met. And that's why our organizations are working together on advocacy. And that's why I want us to think about individual ones as well. And I'm just going to turn it over now. Happy to take questions. But what I've got here as well, I'm going to go through the questions that we've asked here. So what percentage of people don't have anyone to rave out to? That is 20%. Marie Della Vadona asks, the passage of Ontario's Bill 7 has raised serious concerns about the welfare and rights of older people. Loneliness and social inclusion will be increased if older people are removed from family, friends, and advocates in long-term care away from their homes. Haven't we learned anything from the COVID experience? I think we have learned it, Marie. I don't think they care. And that is maybe one of the worst things that I can say. So for those of you from other jurisdictions, this is a piece of legislation that the Ford government brought forward, and it is astonishing and, and frankly horrifying in that it removes an individual's obligation to get consent from another for placement into long-term care. So placement into long-term care in Ontario has always been part of medical consent. You have to consent as the individual person to placement. And now... You don't. Well, we're just waiting for the charter challenge on that. Now, the healthcare system can put you wherever they want. And no matter what they said about trying to make it work, because they don't want bed blockers. Now, no one should be in a hospital when they really should be in long term care. But if the hospital is close to family, friends, and community, that's probably the better place to be when they go into a place that they want to go into. Right now, they can be placed 400 kilometers away, but it is uh, a horror and something that we're absolutely against. So thank you for that. The slides are going to be avail available. And, you know, it's interesting because one of our questions is, I'm a senior without children, and I'm concerned about how I will ensure I have the supports I need. Absolutely. That is a critical question. And now, it doesn't mean necessarily that the kids are going to be helpful, but, but about 75% of people with some extended family or, or friend networks do feel that they have that support. We are increasingly seeing what some folks are calling elder orphans. I don't quite love that title. That's a tone, which it means that you really have outlived everyone or you don't have anyone close to you. This is especially problematic if you are trying to find someone to be your substitute decision maker. Here in Ontario, there's a legislation called the Substitute Decisions Act in other jurisdictions. I know we've got some people from different parts of the, the country, and I'm happy to share what that legislation is called as well. Um, but in that legislation, you pick somebody to be your substitute decision maker. So if you're crossing a road hit by a car and you're in a coma, somebody else will make a decision for you. And hopefully you'll have made something called a power of attorney document in BC. That's called a representation agreement in Nova Scotia. It's a healthcare directive. It's the same thing. It's a piece of paper. It's a legal document that you appoint somebody else to be. But you can't pay someone to do it. You can pay somebody to be a trustee, a financial trustee for you, a financial institution for something like a power of attorney for property. It's not as common as I think actually it should be, but that's just to make your own personal healthcare decisions. 
And then, of course, there's many more reasons to be concerned. And that's kind of why that 3515 with relationships is a really important thing to think about. Because you may need to go out and actually try to build some new relationships. And it can be important to actively think about that and to make good plans around it. Another one is loneliness can be a life situation that excludes any activities or connections that would be considered fulfilling. What makes an older person feel relevant, involved, stimulated, and given that it would be different from each individual is for something that can be effectively addressed as a Thank you for this great question. I will forward along because there's a bunch of really good materials on purpose and vibrancy. And I can, again, forward them along and they can be disseminated to you as well. But the short answer is, if it makes that you feel like you are contributing to society, if it makes you feel like you're doing something that matters, whether it be writing a poem whether it be sharing something online, whether it be going for a walk in the park, whether it be planting bulbs, or whether it be starting a new company at 85. There's no one magic answer, but it needs to fill that sense of vibrancy and purpose for you. And again, I can fill some more things as well. One of the other questions we have is, I keep losing friends due to their deaths, including those who are younger. Yeah, me too. I'm so sorry how hard this has been for you and, and for everybody. And COVID-19 has only made it worse, but it's exacerbated something that we're all really sharing together. How can we deal positively to a change of losses over time? I wish I had a really good answer for you. And I'm happy to come back and work with others to talk about things like dealing with grief and loss. You know, of course, there's no one answer. One of the things that I have learned is that, you know, either asking a person or actively reflecting on, you know, important moments or best moments can help, but loss is loss. And I think it's also important that we let ourselves feel it and acknowledge it instead of just carrying on. And we know that one of the reasons we need to have more psychological services for everybody, I know that you know, teachers often have good psychological services in your plans, but many, many people don't have access to that is because you know grief counseling is very thin on the ground and grief counseling for older people is especially thin on the ground so I think that's a really important to think one of the other pieces is don't forget people who've been hit with divorce after decades of long marriages the emotional and uh, fracturing mental around that we're seeing a massive rise of what's called gray divorce and and it can shatter people's lives it can also be a great reason. I've seen people leave relationships that were abusive after years and years because they decided they these last like, you know, from 70 to 90, they were really going to live their best lives. And we're seeing people kind of coming out of closets as well. But we're also seeing a lot of losses. And, and even if it's a positive change for you, it still will be a transition. So again, that hallmark greeting card, if somebody has done something or if you've had a life change that you're acknowledging, Go back to that three, five, 15 times two and start thinking about what you need to do. I'm going to give the last couple of, uh, of issues again. Somebody wanted me to refresh what the first three. So three close relationships, five people to chat to, 15 people in your network. Times two means that you're going to do it again when it comes to things like meaning and purpose, have different activities that you do. Again, you'll have the slides. In the future proofing formula, a question is, does your spouse partner count as one of the three? Yes, it does, unless you don't talk to them. Um, you, <laughs> so I would count it as one of my three. I leave it for you to consider whether they're one of yours. But yes, ordinarily, they would be, uh, assuming that it's a positive relationship that you're actually engaging with that person with. Um, Another person, I'm aging alone as a gay man with no partner and family. And this is a, a particular issue for people who've moved or people who have family, not necessarily a biological family, but kinship and built family. And he's a friend that they talk to and they talk about these issues, particularly across generational issues. And he talks about uh, particularly around choosing somebody to be a power of attorney. I'm not sure where to find strong connections with those younger than myself which can avoid a creepiness factor, a really important issue. You know, again, that's why I'm talking, honestly, walking the dog is one of those ways. You know, starting some types of clubs and activities can be really good. And even some online, you know, relationships can be really important. Intergenerational 
matters and works. And that's one of the reasons why we know that even if it's generations of people who are like 60 and 80, that can really make a difference too. And I know that there's going to be some great programs in your next one. So I'm going to save that a little bit for the next session as well. And my last couple of questions is how do we make sure that COVID restrictions on residential care is not going to be repeated? Well, I can tell you that we're on that as well. And we do have some assurances, but the only way we can keep those assurances going is through advocacy of, of people like you and the help of the foundation and supporting organizations that do not-for-profit work into helping that. I am so grateful for this opportunity. I'm kind of hoping I get invited back at some point. And if anyone would like to reach out to me, it's very easy. And I will uh, just put my information here as well. I'm Laura at canage.ca. And actually the very fastest way to get a hold of us is info at canage.ca because it's monitored all the time. And uh, and you'll get me, that's fine for each field reach out personally as well. Again, clubs like Rotary or other types of things like that are also great ways to get connected. So sharing the slides with you, I hope I can come back and just huge gratitude for all the work that you have done throughout your careers. And I'm really happy to be a teacher too. Thanks, Laura. I, I think it's pretty safe to say you will be invited back. Thank you to Laura Tamlin Watts from CanAge for uh, sharing your time, your experience, your insight with all of us today. Uh, and for what was, I think, a very refreshingly positive and practical discussion, which is what we need, you know, so, so, so much. So thanks to everyone who joined us today as participants for all the great questions. Um, we will share a slide in a moment with the foundation's contact information for anybody who uh, wants to learn more about what the foundation does, uh, if you don't already, and reach out to us. I do want to mention quickly on the topic of social isolation and inclusion and what we can do about it, and it, which is really what Laura's presentation was all about today. I want to mention that we at the RTO ERO Foundation have developed a program. Uh, the program is called Chime In, and we launched it last fall. I'm sure some of you are aware of it. M many may not be. Chime In is si it's very simple. It's just an online chat group. It's open for everyone to join, all RTO ERO members, anyone actually who'd like to join, uh, to meet and just chat with peers. It's an hour a week, and you just register one time, and then you can jump in as often, as frequently or infrequently as you'd like. Um, and it's been successful so far, and a lot of folks, I think, have made great connections and even made some friends. So we encourage anyone and everyone who's interested. Uh, it's not just for people who are feeling lonely and isolated. It's for anyone who just wants to, you know, maybe check off one or two of the boxes that uh, on, on Laura's uh, great list today and just meet some new people and have some great chats. Um, I think I'll ask Deanna if she hasn't already to just insert the link for Chime In in the chat box. You can also go to the foundation's website, find out more information and how to register uh, there on our site. So back to the webinar. Um, I just wanna mention that all our webinars are free to join. As always, all our presenters, including Laura, are volunteers. So they're donating their time and expertise to inspire us through great uh, and inspirational conversations like this. So uh, in order to help us continue to do these fantastic webinars, we hope you'll consider supporting the RTO ERO Foundation. Again, our info is on uh, on screen right now. Thank you. Um, also, very quickly, before we wrap up, I just want to mention that a very short survey is going to pop up on everyone's screen as soon as the webinar ends. This is to just gather some really quick feedback from you on how we did today um, and help us sort of uh, continue to optimize and improve as we, as we um, put together more webinars for you. Laura, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish? Apologies to any French teachers if I got any of my French wrong. <laughs> That's all that I have to say. I'm really excited to reach out. We're really excited to talk. I want to talk more about things that are not you know, depressing. Um, this was not meant to be that. This was meant to be to think about those key advocacy priorities that we're doing together, plus what we can do to be keeping track of the things in our lives, kind of like how we used to do with our classrooms. Or maybe some of you are still doing it in the classrooms as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate that. I'm sure I forgot some accent somewhere. <laughs> thank you. So it's three o'clock right now. This will conclude today's webinar. Thank you one last time. Again, thank you. Thank you to our presenter, Laura Tamblin Watts from CanAge. And of course, for everyone, uh, all of you for joining us today for the webinar. Please stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. <laughs>